From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Monday, February 14th. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Still talking it out, Russia's foreign minister proposes Vladimir Putin continue diplomatic conversations with the West over Ukraine, and Putin agrees. But tensions remain high as Germany's Olaf Scholz visit Kiev today and Moscow tomorrow. Roiled by geopolitical risks, stocks, bonds, commodities all swing as traders weigh the odds of potential military action. It fuels concerns about inflation and the potential of aggressive central bank action to tame it. And on that note, Bowler doubles down. The St. Louis Fed president repeats he'd like to see rates 100 basis points higher by July. The two-year Treasury yield jumps to the highest since December of 2019. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And Guy, it's a new week, but we're focused on the same stories, geopolitical risk, inflation, and the response on the monetary policy side. Yeah, I I look at the markets this morning, Kaylee, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and I'm really struggling with it. I think there's a number of differences that are hard to explain. Uh, We'll talk to Vince Signorella about this in just a moment when we get to our question of the day. But I think you, you talked in, the, in the, the headlines about geopolitical risk. It feels today like we need to define the difference between mm. geopolitical risk and geopolitical uncertainty. I think risk and uncertainty feel like very different things today. And I think that's why you're getting some of the weird kind of responses you're getting into the market. But this morning when I got into work, first thing, looked like a classic kind of risk off day. Stocks were down. Um, you, you got a bid in the bond markets. Energy complex reacting as well. Gold, precious metals, a little bit of an anomaly. I, there's, a, there's a whole range of kind of classic risk on, risk off kind of signals. But then Bullard muddies the water. We try and figure out what is coming out of Lavrov. We don't know what uh, ultimately the Ukrainian position on NATO seems to be, uh, though Zelensky repeating the fact that they still want to join. So I think there's a whole range of uncertainties here that I think are really hard to deal with. So that takes us to our question of the day. How do you hedge for a potential Russian military action in, in Ukraine. Um, let's talk about it. Vince Signorella uh, joining us. Marcus Ashworth of Bloomberg Opinion also still with us. Um, also with us. Sorry, not still with us. Uh, Vince, <laughs> talk to me a little bit about what you see today because I have to say I'm really confused by some of the price action I'm seeing. And uh, you are not the only one confused. This is uh, traders and I having this conversation this morning. Uh, One of the big things that they are scratching their heads over is the bid in precious metals. And I I think what we're looking at is what you mentioned uh, a short moment ago, is that conversation between risk and uncertainty. I think uncertainty more uh, more the theme and that you you just can't hedge um, the geopolitical risk risk uh, that's going on between Russia and the Ukraine. it's a binary event. Uh, there's simply no way to really trade that. Uh, and so I think what you're seeing is hedges being placed against risks that you're more comfortable long term. So if you're long term comfortable being uh, positive on the equity market, um, you're maybe short term hedging your risk by being long dollars, uh, long a little bit of gold um, and, and, and that and such as that. I, I don't think okay. you can look at it as a as a big one story. Well, and Marcus, to bring you in here, what Vince didn't mention is hedging with bonds. Can they actually serve as a form of safety in an environment where central banks are potentially going to aggressively start hiking? Um, well, I think the only thing I can draw out of all this is, is, is one, if you haven't hedged by now, too late, because you should have had your portfolio. You have plenty of time to figure where you want to be and other how close to your index or, or get into cash or whatever it may be. But the other thing which is really coming through to me is that when and if uh, you know, this, the prospect of war diminishes a little bit, we're seeing bonds jump in yield quite sharply. So in some sense, we know what the underlying trend is. Uh, clearly, bonds yields want to go higher. And I think that's the more interesting thing for me is that when and if this turns out, let's hope not to be uh, anywhere near as scary as it could be, then we will see bond yields substantially higher from here. I think that's that's the one thing which okay. is clear you can see from that, the hedging Marcus, is, is and isn't going on. How much do you think, therefore, broadly, given the fact that we've had this risk surrounding Ukraine for a little while now, do you think th- that that has been suppressing yields 
is it is it possible to quantify what that looks like today? I, I'm looking at the screen in front of me. I got the U.S. 10-year up by 4.2 basis points and the German down by 4.8 basis points. I've got Bullard speaking on one hand. I'm waiting for Lagarde on the other. Does this give us any clue as to, to the impact the Ukraine is having? Well, the only way I can sort of look at it is what happened with Omicron. You saw 10-year US yields down at 135. Now, if you can sort of discount Omicron out of the picture, they're substantially higher. And I think, you know, perhaps what's happening here is that, is that Ukraine is keeping a lid on on that some sense and, and yields. The second they think it's calming down, we can see the, ten, the two years up 10 basis points. I think that tells you all you need to know. So I think the markets are there to fun function out and, and pass out risk as, as efficiently as they can. There, there will come a point whereby, if there is uh, the worst news, that it perhaps won't be as bad as it might have been. That's the only way I think you can look at it. A lot of people who haven't hedged or haven't hedged as much they ought to have done, clearly now are. So, you know, I think some people are, are, are rushing into precious metals, but a lot of people aren't. And therefore, there's plenty enough people here who are prepared to look through this uh, Ukraine situation as something as not being as, as, as difficult as it may have been, say, a month ago. All right. So we've talked about the read through in precious metals, Vince. Let's talk about oil specifically. It's been fluctuating a little today, but still a 93 handle is what we're looking at on WTI. What are the potential ripple effects of higher oil prices, especially if we do eventually reach triple digits? Well, I mean, then that's what everyone's looking for. You make a very good point. A uh, hundred dollars a barrel for WTI seems to be uh, where a large majority of of the energy folks think this is going. I mean, the impacts are enormous because it, not just the price of oil, but the price of gasoline. It's it's such a, a a big knock on disposable income for consumers, and we see that as we look at average hourly earnings uh, last week and when CPI numbers came out. One of the key things that we're we're looking at is the effects on inflation on take home pay, which is real earnings for consumers. It's been negative for now about 10 months. So the higher inflation, the higher energy prices, the lower disposable income, longer term doesn't spell well for risk markets, equities in particular, because if you're spending less and you're buying less, uh, earnings, earnings for corporations and profits are less. Uh, so that I, th I think energy is probably the biggest key. And then, you know, with or without Ukraine, uh, I, I think you're going to see energy prices go up. On the one hand, if, if there is an, a, a situation, a geopolitical risk, you, you see uh, supplies cut off and oil prices go higher. On the other hand, that, that goes away and economies grow and you see energy prices go up. So it looks like there's only one way to go for that. Marcus, we come back to the question. And, and Vince sets it up very nicely about what do you think will be end up being the greater concern for central banks? Will it be a growth shock, growth concern, potentially caused by higher energy prices, could be caused by a number of different factors, including higher interest rates if they go too aggressively, or the inflation narrative that could come from higher energy prices? Do we need to rethink or do we need to think about energy as a tax or an inflation story right now? Difficult one to answer that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in some senses, if oil was going to go higher, it would have done so by now. And I think it's had every opportunity to do so. And it's it's the, the price reaction today tells me quite a bit that I think oil is losing some momentum here. So I, I have a slightly different view to, to Vince on that. With regards to inflation and how central bankers ha handle it, I mean, I think they're, they're not worried about energy, actually. That's not at all. They think that passing through. They're worried much more about food and some second order effects. So what, what we're clearly seeing, despite Bullard's uh, great attempts, he's, he's, he's positioned himself very much on the hawk side, and he's saying that he's going to have to try and convince the rest of his committee to follow him. So I think we'll, we'll see both the Fed and clearly the Bank of England, and also now the ECB, trying to rein in one worry on, on inflation and therefore how far they're going to hike rates. They're going to hike, but not as much as the market is pricing in. I think that will double down on their efforts to try and calm forward rate expectations. Vince, I'm wondering if you agree with that characterization. Jim Bullard not only having to convince his colleagues to move in this way, is the market convinced that the Fed might move in this way, or do we still have further to go to kind of recognize that fact? 
I, I think the market does feel um, that that Bullard, even though he's speaking for himself, is, is maybe closer to what the future majority position will be. We can't say that that's the majority position now. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, one thing to really keep in mind, though, is that a few years ago, Bullard was the Uber dove, not the honk. Uh, and he was not able to bring the majority of the conversation to his view in terms of being uh, adding even more monetary stimulus. And now he's on the other side of the coin. Uh, trying to do the same thing. So uh, I would be a little cautious about just his view by itself in thinking that he yep. can bring everyone into his opinion and a consensus. I, I, I think he I think it's just his view. And, uh, you know, he's he's entitled to his view, as Marcus disagrees with me. <laughs> um, I think there are people on the Fed that disagree, disagree with him. I just would like to make one point is what you had uh, spoken about earlier. Uh, rising inflation and growth are not necessarily a binary situation. You actually can have slower growth and higher prices. They, they don't necessarily have to be uh, something that move in opposite direction. And that is probably, I think, one of the biggest worries of the Fed, that they would potentially lose a handle on inflation. And at the same time, yeah. uh, the economy might slow down. Marcus, let's wrap things up with kind of where you started, which was if you haven't already hedged, it's almost too late. I'm surprised about that. There seem to be a lot of moving parts right now. Both the Fed, central banks more broadly, uh, what is happening with the economy, what is happening with Ukraine, what is going on with China. There seem to be a lot of things that are, that are moving. Aren't we in a position where basically on a day by day basis, we have to adapt to that, review our positions and continue to adapt? Because it looks like it, it's, it, it looks incredibly difficult to call what is happening here. And I come back to this distinction between risk and uncertainty. It feels more uncertain than risky right now. I, we don't know what the outcomes are going to be. We have no idea really what is going to be going on here. I, we're certainly at the, at the right hand side of the Rumsfeld scale. <laughs> Yeah, well, first, I'd just like to say that I agree pretty much with all that Vince says, just slightly. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think this, is, this isn't the semantics of it. You know, if you haven't hedged your portfolio to a situation where you know that every day something else is going to go up, down, left, right, then, then you're not hedged. You know, you're not playing the game here as you, would, you should be with the portfolio management. You shouldn't be having to react to things. You should be in a situation where you can ride with the the flows with some comfort and take advantage of the opportunities, which I said, I'm looking through because I don't know more than anyone else does whether or not it's going to go up, down, left or right. But the point is, there are going to be some great opportunities out of this. Personally, I'd say one of them is shorting oil. But yeah, likewise, that if you get a chance to buy, <laughs> buy low yields on bonds, maybe that's one to do as well. But I mean, you know, I, I don't I just don't think that there is um, necessarily any, any point really trying to second guess all this. Get yourself in situations, I'm sure most portfolio managers should be by now, of, of being able to uh, have some cash on the, on the book and, and in, in some products where you're not too worried yep. about mm. the day-to-day -day ups and downs. And I do feel like we've heard more and more people saying, have a little cash on the sidelines, wait for your moment to get back in. Vincent Signorella of Bloomberg News and Marcus Ashworth of Bloomberg Opinion, thank you both so much. Now coming up, our next guest says geopolitical risks could just have a short-term impact on market sentiment. Nira Pandit, JP Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. equity strategist is warning of the impact of Russian military action, potential Russian military action. Mike Wilson writing in a note to clients overnight, a war, quote, materially increases the odds of a polar vortex for the economy and earnings, and that a spike in energy prices would destroy demand, in our view, and perhaps tip several economies into an outright recession. Let's get more perspective now from Mira Pandan, J.P. Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist, Mira, how do you view the geopolitical risks out there and what the appropriate market response is? Certainly geopolitical consequences could be pretty severe in this case, but from a market perspective, ultimately it comes down to the fact that markets do not like uncertainty and we're seeing a lot of uncertainty right now amidst an already pretty fragile tape. I think the biggest transmission mechanism here in terms of this potential conflict is through oil prices and energy prices and, and how that might put some pressure on 
global growth and the consumer. I think the impacts could be perhaps more severe in areas like Europe that are very reliant on Russia for energy and maybe a little bit more limited on the U.S. But overall, we're, we're certainly seeing a sentiment impact and people looking to hedge in areas like gold, treasuries, the dollar. But what I would say is that investors shouldn't scurry to reposition their portfolios because ultimately what we have seen in the past is that from wars and geopolitical events, markets tend to have a, a shorter lived reaction um, to, to these types of, of, of issues. Mira, just, can I just come back to, to the sort of the gold uh, dollars kind of story? Are, are they enough of a hedge? A lot of people are starting to talk about just simply getting into cash. And that is the best place to be right now. As you say, lots of uncertainty, hard to quantify, potentially creating opportunities. But we operate in a difficult environment. Are we in a position where we should be upping our cash components in terms of portfolios? Well, from a gold and, and treasuries perspective, I think we hedge on the margin. But essentially, in terms of moving to cash, it's just such a challenging trade to make right now when you think about the, the, the context of how high inflation is and how you're losing your purchasing power there. I do still think that there are many areas of the market that should be well supported, given the backdrop of strong global growth overall and above trend growth that has a bit of a cushion here. Um, a strong consumer, strong earnings. So I don't think that we want to broadly reposition too much or we should be too worried about hedging too much. Look, the uncertainty is, is not great, but at the same time, we do want to keep an eye on the fundamentals that are going to be supportive of markets in the longer run. Mira, you talked there about a strong consumer, strong growth, underlying kind of macro fundamentals. Are you not worried that if the Fed tightens aggressively, if it front loads rate hikes like uh, Bullard would like to see them do, that it actually is going to choke off growth down the line and start to be a problem for some of the cyclical areas of this market? It's absolutely a concern and one we're paying attention to quite closely. And, and that's why we would be more biased to, to closer to four rate hikes this year as opposed to some of, some of the other expectations. Now, we could see a bit of a front loading, given the fact that we're still seeing pretty strong economic indicators across the board. But we do expect that a lot of that is going to moderate by the second half of the year. So if the Fed continues on a very aggressive path, that could really jeopardize the growth situation we're in. I think the good news is that we're not necessarily in a growth scare here. We are above yep. trend when it comes to growth and, and really strong when it turns when it comes to consumption. So there is a bit of a glide path here uh, for, from that standpoint. Mira, if energy prices stay as, they, as high as they are, and the consumer, particularly the US consumer, is super sensitive to gas prices, if they stay as elevated as they are right now, do we need to call into question that strong consumer thesis? Ultimately, with the, the amount of cash on the sidelines in terms of how much consumers have and, and this backdrop that they do have, look, we naturally do see some degree of moderation in the consumer throughout the year regardless. But as we see economic activity open up, things open up more, um, it, it should still be a good environment for consumption. I think where we're going to see the biggest impact when we think about higher oil prices and higher energy prices is among the, the lower income households for whom those utilities and then filling up the gas is a higher proportion of their overall budget. But from the perspective of the consumer in aggregate, um, I think that there's still a, a good amount of cushion there for, for this consumer to withstand higher inflation. And yet what we're seeing from all of the surveys is that that willingness and that appetite is being dampened a bit by inflation. Energy prices, of course, are likely to, to continue to put some upward pressure there. Right. So the, the hope is that even if consumer sentiment is somewhat dampened, it doesn't necessarily dampen their ability to, to go out and consume to some extent. And of course, this isn't just a U.S. story, Mira. There's a real cost of living squeeze in the U.K., for example. And I'm wondering how you're viewing where regionally you want to put your money right now. We'd still actually advocate for a relative balance. I mean, last year when we took a look at the, the broad international landscape, essentially it was really hard to resist being invested in U.S. stocks. And yet what we're seeing year to date so far is that Areas like China, uh, many of the Asian economies, Europe, Japan are actually holding up quite well from a stock market perspective in comparison to the U.S. So we're seeing a bit of outperformance there. And if last year was the year in which the U.S. saw a very strong recovery and, and this year is normalizing, this year we could see more durable international recoveries. And what we tend to find in these international markets is that degree and that cyclical exposure there is much higher than you see in the U.S., 
So many of these areas are essentially levered to uh, the, the recovery there. So we think that some of the earnings estimates out there internationally are a bit too conservative. Now, look, this geopolitical risk, of course, creates a headwind. Higher energy prices do create a headwind. But overall, the direction of travel, we think, is, is a global recovery in terms of growth. Mira, great to catch up. Thanks for joining us today. Mira Pandit, JP Morgan Asset Management. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rich Kagupta. Pelton CEO Barry McCarthy is dismissing the idea that the home fitness group could be put up for sale, pledging instead to pursue growth by doubling down on content, expanding to new countries and increasing its product portfolio. That's according to the Financial Times. Pelton stock rallied last week after reports that Nike, Amazon and others were evaluating potential bids. And sources tell Bloomberg that Apple is boosting pay for its U.S. retail work as it navigates a tight labor market. Raises of 2 to 10 percent have been offered to some salespeople and Genius Bar technical support staff. It comes after Apple revealed plans to offer part-time staff paid vacation for the first time, as well as more sick days and childcare benefits. And the Los Angeles Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals 23 to 20 to win the Super Bowl on Sunday. The victory gives the Rams their second ever Super Bowl title and their first as a team based in Los Angeles. The Rams scored a touchdown with less than two minutes left in the game to take the lead. Cooper Cup was named the Super Bowl's most valuable player. And that is your latest business flash, KB Guy. Ritika, thank you. Guy, as you know, I am a huge football fan. I was bummed to see the Bengals and Joe Burrow did not win the game, but most people aren't just watching it for the sport itself, Guy. We also watch it for the commercials, and crypto yeah. and financial services really dominated, dominated the ad slate this year. Coinbase, potentially the most talked about ad with this QR code just bouncing around. I was tempted. I scanned it immediately. It takes you to Coinbase's sign-up page. I thought it was pretty brilliant. Others disagreed, but it got a lot of buzz on Twitter. Absolutely. They did have a few technical issues, which I think yeah. is something you don't want to have. If you're going to make all of this fuss about this, you want to make sure that you can execute on it, yeah. which is kind of 101. So a, a little bit of a fail there, but certainly <laughs> doing well when it comes to the advert. I'd also like to point out there was a lot of chat in the office this morning that Kaylee Lines was wearing red for Valentine's Day. I think we've also now realised that it's orange. I think there's a <laughs> Bengals sort of affinity going on here. This is Bloomberg. We're about an hour into the U.S. trading session. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the moves. Abigail, maybe traders just have some Super Bowl Monday hangovers, but we can't seem to make up our mind. You're right about that. We usually don't like take a look at the Dow futures, but here we are to show that volatility because we are down, up, down once again. Now, not all the indexes are doing this, but this really has to go along with the geopolitical tensions uh, when investors, traders, very fearful. You can see the Dow had been down about the same amount that it's down now, about eight tenths of one percent, and then a bit of a recovery. The Nasdaq. NASDAQ indexes are a little bit higher. The S&P 500 down less, but now down again. So that volatility that Kaylee was referencing that we've seen all year for various reasons. But right now, again, geopolitical tensions uh, in, with, between Ukraine and Russia as they seem to intensify and then perhaps lessen. This is showing in markets, too, a real mixed pe uh, picture here. The S&P 500 down about four tenths of one percent off of its lows. But that VIX not so long ago, moments ago, above 30, now at 29, but still it is elevated. You can also see a bid for bonds here, that 10-year yield, excuse me, the two-year yield up about 10 basis points, close to that 160 again, if that extraordinary backup and then going back down last week. And then finally, interestingly, not supporting a real risk-off picture, the yen basically flat. This is the same picture that we're looking at for individual sectors and movers as well. The energy sector is down sharply. Of course, last week when the Ukraine, uh, Russia, when Ukraine, Russia tensions were intensifying, oil had been up in a big way. Oil movers up. Now we have that Elk XLE down almost 3%. You can see Northrop Grumman, one of the big defense contractors, last Friday getting its best bid since I believe July of last year, up almost 5%. Today lower, suggesting investors are a little bit less are a little bit uh, less worried. That's 
true too for airlines earlier today. They had been uh, lower. Now we have American Airlines up about six tenths of one percent. And then interestingly, this is one of the other pieces that doesn't fit that I know you all were talking about. Gold is higher. Gold miners higher up about one point three percent. I want to take a look at a chart that we looked at that when I presented it last time, it hasn't worked out the way that I was presenting it. So let's keep an eye on this to see what's going on. This is gold. You can see a massive downtrend over the last year or so, but one that's been very volatile, fitting to uh, the uncertainty that's roiling all markets. Right now, breaking out of the range, suggesting that there could be a big break higher. However, if you take a look at the RSI, it's pretty close to overbought. I, when last time I uh, showed this chart, guy talked about the idea that we're going to see gold go back down into the range. I think this chart may still be suggesting that, but right now you have this breakout. Will it be a false initial breakout? We don't know. But right now, this is another piece in this risk off, risk on picture that's very difficult to sort out. We're going to catch up with Ed Morse a little bit later on, get his take on that. Abigail, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Let's get back to that geopolitical uncertainty that we're focusing on. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, countering U.S. warnings that Russia may invade Ukraine within days. Putin staging a televised meeting with a very long table a little earlier on <laughs> with his foreign and defense ministers uh, to show they're making an effort to find a diplomatic resolution. Lavrov, there he is, suggests maybe the talk should continue. Putin, yeah, all right. Let's carry on talking. Slightly undermines the, uh, the position the White House took going into the weekend that war was imminent. Let's go to D.C. now. Bloomberg's Washington correspondent Amory Hordern joining us now. Amory, who's running the table here? We come into the weekend. The headlines are thick. There is talk of imminent war. Uh, and then Putin, with an offhand comment, seems to deflate that whole concept. Well, he certainly did make that offhand comment when he sat down with Sergei Lavrov. And in Russian, he said Horosho, which means good. And the sentiment was really like, all right, Lavrov, continue with the diplomatic path ongoing. Uh, but following the meeting President Putin had with President Biden on Saturday, both Washington and Moscow had the same rhetoric that we've heard for weeks. But Washington is saying we're going to do anything we can to potentially give an off-ramp to President Putin, a dipl diplomatic off-ramp. The one headline for me that both matched up between both briefings from Washington and Moscow was that each President Putin and Biden want their teams to continue to remain engaged and in contact. But we should remember what President Putin was doing today when he met with Lavrov and his defense minister was purely for domestic purposes. Mm. So this is either him saying to his domestic audience, look, I'm continuing on this diplomatic path. We should note that the polls in Russia show that there's very little appetite for, uh, amongst the Russian public for a war with Ukraine. And actually, there's more appetite the closer link to, what, to the West. Anne-Marie, it seems like we've seen this play out time and time again, where Biden speaks to relative leaders, to Vladimir Putin, to the president of Ukraine, saying there will be harsh consequences should Russia make a move. Russia says, you haven't addressed our concerns. Let's keep talking. It's just a repeating pattern. What needs to change to actually find a diplomatic resolution if we haven't been able to find one already? Well, this is the game, right? This is the, the, you know, the saying is everyone's playing checkers, Putin's playing chess. This is the game he is playing, right? If you amass more than 100,000 troops on the border, he's either what the United States thinks he has the potential, given the intelligence they have, and they've been very transparent with the press about to go in, or he's using that as leverage to get what he wants. Now, we know that his main security concerns is redrawing the map back to 1997 when it comes to the NATO forces and that Ukraine cannot join NATO. Now, the United States says that is off the table, but there are secondary security concerns, especially comes with placement of missiles that potentially Putin can take as a win. And then he'll go home to his domestic audience and say, look, the West, what he calls, was at peak hysteria over Ukraine, and I never invaded like I said I wouldn't. All right, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern at the White House for us. Thank you so much. And for more on this, we're joined by Sam Green, King's College London, Russia Institute director. He is also the author of Putin versus the People, the Perilous Politics of a Divided Russia. Sam, great to get your perspective. We were just hearing Anne-Marie talking there about Putin having leverage to get what he wants. What do you think is his end game? 
Well, you know, I, I wouldn't be so sure that he has an end game. Right? I think, to a large extent, the situation that that we find ourselves in actually suits Putin uh, pretty well. You know, he he wins domestically uh, from a sense of, of geopolitical threat and confrontation uh, with the West. It's very important to sort of the, the way that he's legitimized himself over the last uh, seven or eight years and. And uh, certainly supports the idea that if you were thinking about political change in in Russia, now is is not the time to do it. Um, but by the same token, he doesn't win from uh, from an actual conflict. Right, a conflict is in terms of a war. Right, uh, is 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 unpredictable, and it, it doesn't. It's not necessarily something that 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 he uh, would would win, and 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 that Russia would win. Um, so uh, you know, I think. Uh, what he may be aiming for is what we have, which is a, a protracted, uh, open-ended um, uh, stance of, of geopolitical confrontation uh, with the West that very much keeps him at the at the center of attention. Um, but that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, uh, some kind of a, of a lasting solution. It, it continues to give him this ability to uh, to, to manipulate sort of the, the, the fears and anxieties of, of governments, whether in Washington or, or in Kiev. Sam, let's just think about that from the other side of the table. If that is the case, and if Western leaders, Western strategists recognize that, what is their next move on the chessboard or the checkers board to try and change that, change the narrative? If we don't want years and years of this kind of instability, how should we be responding? How should Kiev be responding? We heard from Ukraine a little bit earlier on saying we continue to believe that we should have the option of joining NATO. For instance, if that was removed from the table, how would that change the game? Um, well, I think one of the reasons people don't want to remove that from the table is because while it's, it's possible to have a, a large scale uh, a strategic open-ended conversation about a new security architecture for Europe, which does not have to look anything like the current security architecture, which could, in fact, eventually deliver something that, that, that Putin or any other Russian leader might be more happy with. Uh, the reality is that nobody wants to uh, give Putin that kind of a gift right? when, when they feel like they, they have a gun held to their heads or to, to Ukraine's head. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is, is to be open, that there are things that we can talk about and we should be talking about, and there are things that, that could make everybody more secure, and to recognize that the current situation doesn't suit the West necessarily any better than it suits Russia. Uh, obviously, you know, the Biden administration, London, Brussels would, would rather be, be talking about other things. Um, but uh, as we're having that conversation, I think there's a lot of desire on the part of Western leaders to um, uh, create a bit more security and stability for uh, for Ukraine. What, what they're not happy with is the possibility that if we end up in these very long, protracted conversations, uh, that uh, that Ukraine could be held more or less permanently uh, hostage. More or less permanently. Sam, even if we can find an interim solution to tamp down uh, the escalation we have been seeing in recent weeks, is this just not going to rear its ugly head time and time again? You know, I think it it, it, it very well may. And part of the reason that, uh, that, that it will, I think, is because it does suit uh, Putin's political interest domestically. You know, for, for him, you know, whatever he might achieve eventually on the international scene is is not worth very much if he's not still in power uh, in uh, uh, in Russia. There are very real problems uh, uh, in the Russian economy and the handling of the pandemic and, and the fact that they haven't been able to to increase uh, Russia's sense of uh, Russians, ordinary Russian sense of, of well-being over the last seven or eight years. Uh, and and so getting them to focus on on conflict, getting them to focus on this sense of of of, of uh, international threat and 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 frankly, to, to accept a degree of sacrifice uh, in order to, uh, to to win that threat is 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 something that's potentially uh, um, a win from uh, fr fr from his perspective. How unpopular would a war be in Russia? That's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, look, we, we've had uh, again, you know, Russia has been at war with Ukraine now for uh, for for seven plus years, going on eight years uh, next month. And uh, despite a lot of propaganda, right, it has not really built a sense of of public support, uh, as your reporter was saying earlier, right, for uh, a larger scale military confrontation with uh, uh, with Ukraine, and, and I really don't see that changing. If a war happens, there will be a rally around the flag uh, effect. Uh, it, it will probably be relatively short-lived. I mean, Putin has advantages, right? He controls all of the television stations. He basically controls all the political parties um, in the in the parliament. So he will dominate that that conversation. Uh, but he, that won't change um, a Russian sense of 
of, uh, of, of what's going on in their own country, in their own pocketbooks, in their own uh, livelihoods for, for, for very long. Sam, thank you very much indeed for the analysis and the insight. We greatly appreciate it. Sam Green, King's College London, Russia Institute Director. Thank you very much indeed. What are we going to be doing next? Taking uh, another look at the markets through the lens of what is happening in Ukraine. We're seeing certainly volatile oil markets, uh, crude fluctuating over tension in Ukraine and around Ukraine. City Zed Morse, bearish on crude. He joins us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, I'm Rich Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Tune in to Bloomberg's monthly series, Chief Future Officer, this episode featuring Macy's CFO, Adrian Mitchell, is now on Bloomberg.com and YouTube. This is Bloomberg. Oil pushing closer to $100 a barrel in the face of geopolitical tensions over Ukraine. Joining us now is Ed Moore, City Global Head of Commodities Research. Ed, you've been persistently on the bearish end of the spectrum when it comes to this oil market. Should we see Russia take military action in Ukraine, which of course it has denied its plans to do? Will it cause you to rethink that bearish thesis? It, it won't really, and it wouldn't even if uh, oil goes over 100 uh, for a time being, I would not be surprised if there could be as much as a 10% increase in prices if there were military action that went to Kyiv. But um, the long-term supply demand balance remains the same. We don't think that Russia is going to stop exporting gas or oil to Europe, two of their biggest markets, uh, one on the gas, one on the oil side. And it looks very unlikely that European countries are going to take action to stop importing contracted oil or gas from Russia. So we think the, the supply situation will go back to normal uh, if there were to be military action. And then over the course of the year, all of the bearish factors on the supply side that we see coming into the market will still come into the market. Ed, if you were thinking about the Ukrainian crisis and the inflation story, and you were trying to figure out where the Venn diagram overlaps best to provide a hedge for a portfolio, where would it be? Where would I be looking? Is it the metals market, the energy market? You just kind of discounted the energy market, but are there other places I should be looking? Well, we think the gold market is already reflecting that. It makes sense that there is two risks around geopolitical risk, and now with the Fed raising rates, and you'd think that would make the dollar more attractive than gold, but uh, the gold is a great, in, in, great uh, hedge on uh, on both the recession side and the inflation side. So uh, that would be one. Um, we are very positive the metals. Some of the metals are likely to, uh, if there were to be sanctions imposed on Russia, would likely to hit Russian exports of aluminum and nickel and palladium. Um, in the European market, there's not much you can do uh, to uh, through the financial markets to, uh, to hedge with palladium, but there are certainly things that can be done with aluminum uh, nickel and copper. Well, talk more about your aluminum call because you think it could be up to $3,400 a ton uh, in the next three months or so. Then it's going to consolidate over the next six to 12. Why take that track? Well, there are very good reasons to do that. Uh, th and there's, there are double reasons. So the market itself, we think, is going to see bigger deficits than anyone had expected for this year. Uh, the, the little bump in the road is we're going to see aluminum smelters that have been shut in uh, for a variety of reasons, environmental, the Olympics and the like. Uh, in China, the cost of, um, of energy supply to aluminum uh, smelters in Europe being another one. Uh, well, we see the supply demand balance tightening. We see the potential for Russian sanctions uh, on companies that are doing the exports of aluminum that will make it more difficult to export it. So uh, we do have that $3,400 call, and we know the price has come off a, a little bit. Uh, but with China easing and the end of the Olympics, we think um, price is going to go up. Ed, how much of what we see in the price currently in the metals market and in the commodities more sort of broadly is financial hedging, financial flows, and how much of it is real demand? 
There's a bit of both. So on the financial flow side, you just have to look at the implied volatility uh, across all commodities. The implied volatility on certain Russian kinds of exports has been very high. It's been in the 90% range for uh, aluminum. Uh, it's been there for nickel. It's been there for wheat. When you look at the oil market or the gas market, the implied volatility is at a much lower level, high uh, for, for uh, historical purposes at around the 50% level. But you don't have that feeling of political risk entering the volatility um, in oil and gas to the mm. degree you do in the metal markets. Well, talking geopolitics, this has to do with Russia, but not specifically to the Ukraine issue. Russia's top diplomat to the uh, talks on the Iranian nuclear deal actually sounded pretty optimistic, saying world powers have made, quote, significant progress. How do you view the potential factor of Iranian crude coming back onto the market? So we think that there's a high probability on it. The Russians uh, are mediating it. I think the Russians had a hand in convincing the U.S. to drop its uh, desire to go beyond the JCPOA and getting a new nuclear agreement. The U.S. has agreed that it's not going to ask for more. Uh, and the Russians have a role to play, including taking enriched uranium out of the country. And the link to Ukraine is that Putin is acting like a statesman. And he can, should there be that uh, Iranian deal so elusive so far, should it come into play, uh, Putin will take the credit for it. And that could make easing on Ukraine a lot easier. There's a headline a little bit earlier on suggesting that President Raisi of Iran is going to travel to Gaza on Thursday. Uh, so maybe an indication potentially of some news coming on that front. Can I just take a step back, though, and look at the, the broader picture for OPEC, Ed? Um, the Secretary General, uh, Bakindo, was speaking a little bit earlier on. I think he was at an energy conference talking about the fact that he's worried that OPEC won't be able to... to, to meet demand. There, there is this fear that actually OPEC is not able to deliver upon these 400,000 barrel increases uh, that it says it's going to do, but then is ultimately unable to do so because it doesn't have the spare capacity. What, what is OPEC delivering right now? How far away from those targets is it currently? And is that problem going to persist? So first of all, I'd like to say that 400,000 barrels a day was always a fiction. It included the benchmarks of where all of those OPEC plus countries had started before they stopped uh, producing as much oil. Some of them will not be able to come back for a very long time, if ever. Uh, but the share of that 400,000 barrels a day that can come back, has been coming back, has been around 260,000 barrels a day on average per month. And we don't see any reason why that won't stop. I also think that the uh, spare capacity argument is a bit elusive, and I'll, I'll give you three examples of it, if you will. One, Russia certainly doesn't have the capacity to bring back a million barrels a day in 90 days, let alone sustain it for six, for six months. But it does have the capacity to bring a million three hundred thousand barrels a day into the market sustainably between now and the end of the year. It can't do it in 90 days. It doesn't meet the spare capacity argument, but it'll be there. U.S. short cycle oil has no spare capacity at the moment, but we think it's going to have 1.3 million barrels a day of additional increments. So looking at spare capacity in the setting of history, like the beginning of the decade of the century, when uh, we had no spare capacity and no incremental oil sands, no incremental uh, deep water, yeah. no incremental shale, uh, we had the price go up on a sustainable basis. We do have a revolution technologically now that can bring that oil into the market sooner. So uh, the, it, that, that argument on spare capacity just doesn't weigh as heavily now as it did 20 years ago. Ed, always great to catch you up. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your views. Really appreciate it. Ed Morse, City Global Head of Commodities Research. This is Bloomberg.
34 minutes, the European equity market closed. European equities off their lows, but still down and down hard. We are pricing in some of the Friday price action out of the United States. You need to bear that in mind as well. But we came into work first thing this morning. European equities were down and down hard, circa 3% plus. So we've come back from that, but we're still down by around 2%. We're trading just below 460. Every single sector is in negative territory. The banks are down. That's where the losses are really coming from. Uh, we have seen today a bid in core bonds. So yields have been coming lower. Uh, that less good for the, uh, for the banking sector. Uh, rising yields have been a big benefit recently here in Europe. Euro dollar is down, four tenths of 1%. The market's running home to the dollar. Brent crude absolutely flat. The European close is coming up next. We'll continue to focus on what was happening in and around Ukraine. Guntram Wolf is going to be joining us from Bruegel. We've also got Christine Lagarde speaking in the next hour. We'll bring you that live. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.